The Joyful Friar podcast is made possible by the generous support of our friends. To support the podcast, please visit nathan-castle.com and donate today. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Joyful Friar podcast. I'm Father Nathan Castle, your host. This is the after school edition of the Joyful Friar because I've been teaching school uh, today. I'm in a, a Catholic high school where I've been invited to be in classes for a couple of days. Today was day one. And I've been invited to speak to students about my afterlife interrupted work. Many of them are online and uh, had, uh, had already seen material from either this podcast or uh, my appearances on other people's podcasts. And, you know, a lot of people, even young people are interested in what happens when you die. And so um, I was invited and had a great time today with freshmen and sophomores uh, exploring these questions of uh, what happens when we die, especially seen through the uh, experience of the ones who have come to be in my prayer partners and whose stories we've told in books. Well, this is uh, part two of a trilogy. Last week, I introduced the character of uh, not-so-simple Simon, the savant, uh, and his mother, Maylene. If you recall, you could go back and and, and see that uh, previous episode, but Simon was uh, on the autism, autism spectrum, and he, from an early age, was teased in school, um, knew that he wasn't stupid or simple, uh, but he learned differently than other people, and he he had much more aptitude for math and science than he did for things that were more what he called subtle or subtle subtleties. Uh, he got through college with the help of his mother, Maylene. He worked in a lab doing research on exoskeletons, how we might create wearable spines that might enable human persons who have had spinal cord injuries or for one reason or another uh, don't have uh, control of their musculature and movement, maybe they can wear a garment that um, makes it possible for them to walk again or perform functions that they couldn't uh, otherwise. He was doing that research when alone in a lab, he introduced too much electricity into his own body, which he was using uh, experimentally, and it caused his heart to stop and caused his death. So again, you can catch that whole story in the previous episode or in uh, Afterlife Interrupted Book 3. Compassionate response. Um, normally, I think of compassionate response as being me responding to the emails and um, comments that I get from people that have already read a story, but these stories haven't been out in the public for very long. So the body of response for me to respond to is small. But um, but anyway, I've gotten a little bit and I have my own thoughts on um, that I'll express on this podcast. One of them is simply that in this story, this child entered the world with this autism spectrum issue. Sometimes things of this nature are called a disability because they make it difficult for people to be able to do a thing. That's what disability means. Um, in my lifetime, there's been the Americans for Disabilities Act that's changed a lot of architecture and uh, ways in which people who were thought to just be handicapped can be accommodated so that they can take part more fully in the life of everyone else. Um, but most of us know somebody who has some uh, characteristic that makes them appear to be less than whole and then having to accommodate in some way by the use of a walker or wheelchair uh, in this exoskeleton research, something that helps them uh, be more able than they might otherwise be. One of the things that I think this story illustrates is that um, one way to think of persons like Simon is that even if their 
current state of being appears to present us with some lack, some disability, that's a temporary state. If you believe, as I do, that we're eternal beings, these uh, physical disabilities or even mental ones, cognitive ones, are temporary. We're still looking at a whole person with a whole human life here and hereafter. And if we can train our minds to it, we don't need to see disability. We just see personhood. We see a whole person who is having to make these accommodations to uh, make up for some uh, physical or mental deficiency. Maylene, uh, uh, Simon's mother, certainly saw him that way very early on, and she made the decision that she was going to pour love into this child, and she was going to help this child maximize all of the potential that he had that others might not see. Loving people do that. They don't have to be parents, but anyone who's truly loving can look at another and see more than uh, might be outwardly apparent. You can see wholeness, fullness. Um, we, uh, my prayer partners and I were all in awe of Maylene, Simon's mother. She didn't go out of her way to flatter herself. She just told the basic details of her story. But it was quite clear to all of us that this person lived a, a, an extraordinarily loving, heroic life, even moving to the college town where he got his laboratory job and w helping him get through college by taking care of many of his physical needs. Um, she just loved that child that into a, into young adulthood in a way that was um, inspiring. Um, that's a, an example of a kind of dedicated, loving companionship that blesses the world. I, I don't know how she say it. Um, so it's a kind of uh, life-giving way of being that I don't see celebrated in the culture uh, when we you know, thank military persons for their service or, or police or... Uh, as a priest, sometimes I get people that thank me for just being a priest. If you see somebody that's that, that's living that life for one of their children, or maybe people that go out of their way to teach special education, I hope that you'll thank them from time to time, and just say, "I see what you're doing, and I I know that it's um, sacrificial, and I'm grateful for what you're doing." I think that would be a help. Um, one of the things about Simon was the fact that he died alone in a lab. He told us that he preferred to be alone, which was why he was alone at the time of his death. And he didn't make anything of it. Uh, he didn't think it was a horrible tragedy that he died at all or that he died alone. But I wanted to speak to that question of dying alone. Uh, earlier in my life, I studied gerontology as a college student. And sometimes in... Um, an elder population, a group of elderly folk might um, learn that one of their members died and uh, their body wasn't found for several days. And isn't it awful that he or she died alone? Well, that is a sadness. There's no question about it. But um, I would push back a little bit in a, in a polite way if I have the opportunity and say, uh, at least here on a podcast, do you think that's really the way it works? Because I don't. I've I've seen too much in these years of this odd ministry of mine that even when it appears that someone dies alone, their guardian is always on the job. Everybody has a, a loving guardian companion that, that Catholics call a guardian angel. And one of their more important moments in their uh, relationship with the one they guard is the moment of their death. Um, I really do believe that we're accompanied even if there wasn't any other living human on the scene at the time. We Catholics have the uh, Hail Mary prayer that we pray to the mother of Jesus um, that at the end of it, it says, 
Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. We invite uh, the presence of uh, the Mother of God to be with us at the hour of our death. Um, I've seen all these people talk about their deaths, and very often they talk about the role their guardian had in it. Many times when people have died in car crashes, uh, they're, they have told my prayer partners and me that even though I flew through the windshield, I wasn't in my body at the time. It must look awful to people that I suffered, but my guardian was, was skilled at getting me out of the body before that happened, and I didn't have to endure that. That's one thing they do. The guardians also keep people company. Not everybody knows that they have a guardian. I've had, had plenty of people talk about this, that they didn't know they had a guardian, and they didn't know who this person was that stayed with them so consistently and was so kind to them because they don't necessarily look, you know, have wings and look like conventional depictions of angels, but they're steady companions. And uh, sometimes they won't be chased away. They're just patient with people that are um, uh, annoyed or frustrated. I'm really only trying to say that the idea that anyone is radically alone I just don't think that's the way the universe works. Uh, that idea of no man is an island where we can uh, we can certainly construct things in a way that we have a lot more solitude or privacy or um, uh, if we choose. And then sometimes events that are not of our choosing intervene and it looks like, for example, we died alone. Well, maybe, maybe not. I'm, I'm speaking to you, if you're grieving the loss of someone and part of the pain that you're going through is the idea that couldn't it have happened another way? Did she really have to die alone? Did he really have to die alone? I wonder if you would try um, shifting a bit, turning, and thinking, well, what if it's true that he had companionship help at that moment and wasn't just left to go through that uh, all by himself. I just think God's loving universe is built in such a way that that really sacred moment of leaving this body and going on to our next form of life is not done in isolation, even if it seems that way on this side. So I would offer that in, by way of compassionate response because Simon did die alone and then if you notice in his story, he didn't care. And the fact that it happened because of an accident that he caused, he didn't really care about that either. He said, I know some people would kick themselves over making such a mistake. And then he went literal the way that a, a person with autism might and say, it would be really hard to kick yourself. You might take one foot and kick the other leg, but that's about all you can do. You can't kick your back. You can't kick your torso. Uh, anyway, he went literal on it. But he didn't really... Uh, uh, give that much thought at all, the fact that he had died or the fact that he caused his death accidentally or that he died alone. He just didn't care. And uh, in some of the this kind of work that I've done with my prayer partners over the years, I've seen that people that died in ways that might be grieved is really tragic and awful. The person who actually went through it doesn't really care. And <laughs> And if if they uh, if they could, you know, reach beyond the grave and and uh, get through to the person that's grieving them, they might well say, "Give it a rest. I'm okay. It was just a moment." Uh, so, I think we have to be at the caught at just the right moment to receive that kind of thing. You might hear that kind of thing, you know, a couple of dozen times before somebody says it. And in, in, in just the right way, just the right moment, that, that key turns the lock and people will go, you know what? I think you're right. So anyway, if you're grieving someone's death and, and part of it is uh, sadness in you that they died alone, um, by the powers vested in me, stop it. <laughs> I'm not the boss of you. But if I could take that away from you and uh, enable you to have a happier life, I'd do that in a heartbeat. Try to uh, push against that idea. 
one other thing, uh, and I'll probably end with this, is that Simon modeled for us openness to new learning, not just while he was embodied, but afterwards. If you remember his story, in the afterlife, he wanted more of what was familiar. He wanted more math and science. And there was a whole new physics to understand in the afterlife. Uh, the physics of not being in a physical body anymore, but having some other kind of body. There were just all kind of new physics to learn about. Uh, but he he had um, he didn't even consider uh, any anything that wasn't mathematical and scientific because he had gotten so used to not being good at that because of uh, the way his cognition worked. He had to be reminded that body died, and with it died um, the malfunctioning systems that disposed you that way. You're not that way anymore. You don't need to be think of yourself as unable to appreciate art and music and subtleties is what he called them. And he he took that in as a, a logical data point. He heard that and he said, you know what? That's true. And then they put it to him that you loved experimentation. You loved trying to see if you did this or that, maybe it would have this desired outcome well couldn't you experiment with your new way of life and start doing some things like going to concerts or going to a restaurant or going to experiencing things that would have been uh, subtleties earlier that would have just been annoying when they put it to him in terms of experimentation that was right up his alley and he, he essentially said you mean you just want me to be an experimenter with trying new things oh, well, I already was an experimenter. So I'm going to experiment with new things. So that worked for him to be open to learning something new. And it can be so easy to not want to learn something new. It can be so easy to let our egos just say, that's just the way I am. And I'm fine the way I am. Leave me alone. Uh, I've got this. Um, this is my story and I'm sticking to it. There are all kinds of ways that we can not change, not grow. And I think Simon is a great model. I mean, uh, uh, with the with his autistic uh, issue, he had more reason than many people to say, no, I'm not going to do that. I can't, I won't. Uh, and when it was put to him that he was as able as anybody else, uh, he was able to just say, I I get it. I see what you're talking about. And then, of course, lovely Maylene, his mother, showed up to do what she had always done and on an afterlife plane, help him explore afterlife things the way she had on Earth when she took him to the zoo as a child and let him stand in front of the same animal for uh, a long time before he moved on to the next one. She was right there to say, let's learn how to go to a restaurant. We'll do that next. And he was he was so confident of her love that he had a companion in his exploring and off they went. And God only knows what they did after that because we only get the little snapshot that we do. Uh, presumably he's learn, learning lots and lots more things. I might close with this. I had a friend once who was a woman um, who I think at birth her legs were too short or misshapen around the pelvis and whatnot. I think even as a baby, she couldn't uh, stand and walk. And I think was in a wheelchair even, you know, at the age that another child might have been walking. And I think the way that it that her life played out, uh, she went to college. This is why I knew her. She graduated college and she did political advocacy in uh in government and one of the things i learned from her uh that uh that if you if you get politically active it involves a lot of late nights i don't know why these committee meetings and stuff need to go to all hours but she was uh, in a wheelchair and having to take public transportation to get to meetings and things and there she was she was always advocating for uh, people who had a disability of some kind particularly 
one of the things she told me was that um, there's there's very little money in caring for people that need uh, personal care, and that um, a lot of the people that end up doing that work uh, were not suitable for other employment, and sometimes they're kind of scary. And um, anyway, she she was advocating for uh, government programs that helped people that needed uh, personal assistance with uh, self-care and, and all that to be able to live productive lives without worrying about that kind of thing. She used the phrase uh, tab, tabs. She she said that in that in the community of disabled persons, that people like me were called tabs, T-A-B-S, that we were the temporarily able-bodied, T-A-B, and that uh, being in a body that was not able could be a part of the future of anybody. And so she uh, she taught me to think when I see somebody that uh, relies upon a wheelchair or some other uh, way of being in the world that uh, that looks like a handicap, she reminded me that I'm, uh, I'm temporarily able-bodied. I still am temporarily able-bodied. Maybe I will be uh, all the way to my death. Uh, that would be nice, but um, anyway, if 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 it were uh, in my future to need to be uh, assisted in the ways that Simon was, uh, I'd I'd really like to have somebody like Maylene around, somebody that was was there to push and help me uh, uh, do whatever it is that I needed to do. So as you know, compassionate compassion means to suffer with, and and not just commiserate, which I think is to just be within misery, but to move through suffering uh, to um, peace or to goodness, productivity, however you want to think of it. So those are the some reflections that I have in, by way of compassionate response to the story of uh, Simon and Simon's mother, Maylene. Uh, if you have others that you'd like to contribute, you can be in touch with me through my website and through info at nathan-castle.com. I'd love to hear from you. Next time, the third part of this trilogy will still be about Simon's story, but it will be some sort of spiritual practice that might um, grow from having shared this story. So for now, that's uh, this edition of the Joyful Friar podcast. I'm Father Nathan Castle. Grateful that you were with, with me today. And remember that I'm praying for you and whatever is uh, deepest in your heart. Okay? God bless you. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Joyful Friar. Please like, follow, and subscribe. You can visit me at nathan-castle.com. Send me a message by clicking the contact button. God bless.